The story you're about to hear is a compilation of documented true facts about historical characters, events, or locations. Please sit back and listen as I narrate this story to you. The strange story of the Cottingley Fairies began in the summer of 1917 when Frances Griffiths, then nine years old, and her mother returned to England from South Africa to stay with the Wright family in Cottingley, West Yorkshire. The small wooded valley through which Cottingley Beck flowed was next to the house where Polly and Arthur Wright and their 16-year-old daughter Elsie lived. Frances and Elsie were cousins. Cuttingly Beck still flows picturesquely over rocky outcrops shaded by trees, exactly the kind of beautiful location that children enjoy exploring. It quickly became a favorite hangout for the two cousins, who were frequently chastised for returning home wet and untidy after playing in and around the Beck. When they were chastised for getting wet, they explained that they went there to see the fairies. In July 1917, the pair asked to borrow Elsie's father's camera, explaining that they wanted to photograph the fairies that they had been playing with all morning. Elsie's father agreed with a laugh and demonstrated how to use the camera. The girls returned an hour later, declaring their project a success. And when Mr. Wright developed the plate that evening, he discovered that there was, in fact, a fairy posing with Francis in the photograph. He, on the other hand, dismissed the girl's explanation, assuming the picture was a hoax. He inquired as to why there appeared to be bits of paper in the photograph. Elsie's father, Arthur, was an enthusiastic amateur photographer with his own dark room and all of the necessary equipment to develop the plate the girls had taken. Frances is seen with her head slightly tilted, gazing off to the right of the photographer in the now famous photograph. Several winged fairy figures dressed in diaphanous clothing are dancing in front of her. Frances appears to be trying hard not to laugh. Elsie was interested in photography, had a talent for art, and had experience with touching photographs. Arthur Wright became suspicious right away. Arthur remained unconvinced even after the girls returned in September with an impressive plate depicting Elsie holding out her hand to a gnome-like winged figure. He knew the girls had been up to something, but he had no idea how they'd done it. The most plausible explanation appeared to be that they'd used cut-out figures. Arthur's intuition was correct, though it would take decades for that to be confirmed. Elsie's mother, Polly Wright, on the other hand, had a stronger belief in the supernatural and was more intrigued by the photos. In 1919, she attended a spiritualism lecture and afterward showed the photos to the speaker, asking him if they might be true after all. The evening lecture's topic was appropriately fairy life, and the speaker brought the photos to the attention of Edward Gardner, a leader of the Theosophical Movement, who in turn asked a photographer, Harold Schnelling, to examine them. Schnelling stated that the photographs were genuine and fake photographs of single exposure, open-air work, show movement in all the fairy figures, and there is no trace whatever of studio work involving card or paper models, dark backgrounds, painted figures, etc. Gardner claimed that two images were supernatural proof that great metaphysical changes were occurring, seizing an opportunity to promote the Theosophist's most important spiritual message, that humankind was undergoing a process of transformation that would eventually lead to the species' perfection. Gardner used the images in his lectures and later had prints made to sell. The images were published in a spiritualist magazine and caught the attention of Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, a fervent believer in spiritualism, who was seized on the images, convinced they were conclusive photographic proof of the existence of supernatural fairy beings. He was about to write a piece about fairies for the Strand magazine's Christmas issue, and he asked Arthur and Elsie for permission to use the images. In August 1920, the girls took three more photographs of fairies at Doyle's request. Doyle then wrote an article about the photographs that appeared in the December 1920 issue of the Strand magazine in which he argued vehemently for the image's authenticity. This article drew the photos to the attention of the general public, igniting an international debate that pitted spiritualists against skeptics. Conan Doyle's belief in this and other matters is still a mystery. He had apparently been completely duped by the Piltdown Man hoax, and since neither the Piltman Down nor the Cottingley fairies would be exposed as hoaxes until after his death, he presumably continued to believe in their veracity until the day he died. 
As for the Cottingley fairies, beautifully drawn images of fairies were most likely created by Elsie and staged and photographed by both girls. They were made from images in Princess Mary's gift book, which was published in 1914, and then had wings added to them. They were sufficiently plausible, held upright with hat pins, to be accepted by Conan Doyle and many others. Perhaps the timing had something to do with how quickly the images were accepted. The horrific reality of the 1914 to 1918 war would drive people to yearn for a different world, one in which magic might still exist. Conan Doyle's own son was killed in the war. Fairies, gnomes, and other supernatural creatures were popular subjects for mass market prints, pottery, and ornaments in the 1920s and 1930s. Walt Disney's fairy tale cartoons captured the imagination of children and adults alike as cinematography advanced. People believed in fairies because they wanted to believe in them. They wanted to believe in the girls and their story. Supernatural beings still lived their secret lives in a forgotten corner of the green and pleasant isle, revealed only to a select few. Shown are the five Cottingley fairy photos in the order in which they were taken. The text of the accompanying descriptions comes from the fairies, the Cottingley photographs, and their sequel by Edward Gardner, published in 1945. Number 1. Francis and the Fairies Taken July 1917 Camera, Midge Quarter The negative was a little overexposed. The waterfall and rocks are about 20 feet distance behind Francis, who is standing in shallow water inside the bank of the beck. The coloring of the fairies was described by the girls as shades of green, lavender, and mauve, most marked in the wings and fading to almost pure white in the limbs and drapery. Number 2 Elsie and the Gnome, taken September 1917. Camera, Midge Quarter. Elsie was playing with a gnome and beckoning it to come onto her knee. The gnome leapt up just as Francis, who had the camera, snapped the shutter. He is described as wearing black tights, a reddish jersey, and a pointed bright red cap. Elsie said there was no perceptible weight, though when on the bare hand, the feeling is like a little breath. The wings were more moth-like than the fairies, and of a soft, neutral tint. Elsie explained that what seemed to be markings on his wings are simply his pipes, which he was winging in his grotesque little left hand. Number 3. Francis and the Leaping Fairy, taken August 1920. Camera, Cameo Quarter. The fairy is leaping up from the leaves below and hovering for a moment. It had done so three or four times. Rising a little higher than before, Frances thought it would touch her face and involuntarily tossed her head back. The fairy's light covering appears to be close-fitting. The wings were lavender in color. Number 4. Fairy Offering a Posy to Elsie Taken August 1920 Camera, Cameo Quarter The fairy is standing almost still, poised on the bush leaves. The wings were shot with yellow. An interesting point is shown in this photograph. Elsie is not looking directly at the sprite. The reason seems to be that the human eye is disconcerting. If the fairy is actively moving, it does not matter much. But if motionless and aware of being gazed at, then the nature spirit will usually withdraw and apparently vanish. With fairy lovers, the habit of looking at first a little sideways is common. Number 5. Fairies and their sunbath taken August 1920. Camera, Cameo Quarter. This is especially remarkable as it contains a feature quite unknown to the girls. The sheet or cocoon appearing in the middle of the grasses had not been seen by them before, and they had no idea what it was. Fairy observers of Scotland and the New Forest, however, were familiar with it and described it as a magnetic bath woven very quickly by the fairies and used after dull weather in the autumn specially. The interior seems to be magnetized in some manner that stimulates and pleases. Skeptics pointed out a number of flaws in the photos, including the obvious ones that the fairies appear to be made of paper. For example, why is Francis not looking at the fairies in the first photo? The girls claimed they were so accustomed to the fairies that they often ignored them. And why is it that the second fairy from the left lacked wings? Why is Elsie's hand strangely elongated in the second photo? This was attributed to the camera slant by Francis. 
Why is the fairy dressed in the latest French fashions in the fourth photo? Despite these issues, the photos continued to draw followers. Much of this belief can be attributed to the historical context. The English had been emotionally bruised and battered by four years of unrelenting bloodshed by the end of World War I. They appeared to be in desperate need of something to reaffirm their fate in goodness and innocence. They found this reassurance in Francis and Elsie's fairy photographs. It wasn't until 1978 that James Randi noticed that the fairies in the photos were very similar to figures in a children's book called Princess Mary's Gift Book, which had been published in 1915, just before the girls took the photos. Elsie Wright later admitted to Joe Cooper, who interviewed her for the Unexplained magazine in 1981, that the fairies were in fact paper cutouts. She explained that she drew the fairies after being inspired by Princess Mary's gift book. She then cut out paper cutouts of these sketches and pinned them to the wall with hat pins. The tip of a hat pin can be seen in the middle of the creature in the second photo, of Elsie and the gnome. Doyle had noticed this dot but mistook it for the creature's belly button, leading him to believe that fairies like humans give birth. Even though it's difficult to believe now, Debate over the authenticity of the Cottingly fairies raged on until the 1960s. In the following decade, television provided even more opportunities for investigative journalism and the images were scrutinized even more. They were not entirely debunked, however, until the 1980s when Geoffrey Crowley, the editor of the British Journal of Photography, conducted a thorough investigation and concluded they were forgeries. Both cousins were still alive in the 1980s, and Elsie finally admitted to the hoax in 1983. What had undoubtedly begun as a cleverly staged managed bit of fun, suggested by Francis, had quickly spiraled out of control. The cousins were astounded by how easily people of Conan Doyle's caliber accepted the images. Perhaps, unwilling to give up the story entirely, Francis insisted her entire life that the fifth and final image, Fairies and Their Sun Bath, depicted real fairies and not fakes. Hey everyone, I just wanted to express how grateful I am that you took time out of your day to listen to my narration. This is Nikki of Twisted Mind and I'd like to wish you a wonderful rest of your day. Salamat.